Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us. My name is Jay Williams. I have the privilege and the opportunity of serving as the president of the Hartford Foundation for Public Giving. And I can tell you that we are exceptionally excited to be here. And as you all know, thank you for your patience. We had originally scheduled this a few weeks ago uh, and had our backup snow date, which a little bit early on, I was a little bit cynical as why we needed so many snow dates, because, you know, what are the chances that it would actually snow uh, or have inclement weather on the times that we planned this. And on a couple of occasions, we have indeed needed that. So we are thrilled to be here for a number of reasons, not the least of which that this is our final session of our 20-stop, 20 29-town listening tour in each and every one of the communities that we serve. And it's certainly uh, not because this is the least important community. Sometimes they say you save the best for the last. Uh, I would ask you to keep that between us so the other 28 communities don't uh, uh, think that we have slighted them. But we are excited and thrilled to be out here in Simsbury. And before we get started, uh, I just wanted to acknowledge, uh, first and foremost, the Simsbury Public Library, Lisa Karam, uh, the library director, for hosting us. Thank you for hosting us in this beautiful facility. I looked over, and there's still plenty of food. In fact, way too much food. For the amount of people we have sitting here, there's way too much food still untouched on the table. So please, by all means, uh, now, throughout the session, before you go home, uh, make use of Fitzgerald's Foods, who has catered for us this evening. So thank you to Fitzgerald's. Uh, our videographer this evening is the Simsbury Community Television. So thank you all for uh, helping to cover that. Uh, our photographer, uh, Defining Studios, Roger, has been with us for so many of these events. We thank you for your talent and time. And uh, I never, again, cease to be amazed by the talent of uh, Costanza Segovia from Veil Veil Designs, who will be capturing uh, through a live doodle uh, the exchange, the feeling, uh, the, the observations that we all share here this evening. So, as I said, this is the culmination of a commitment that we made in late 2017. Uh, as I had the opportunity to arrive uh, and, and really uh, engage the staff and the board, uh, we collectively decided that as we were going to evolve as a community foundation, uh, we wanted to ensure uh, that we, may, we remain relevant uh, and, and an impactful and a valuable asset to this community, as we had been for uh, 90 plus years. Uh, and there's no better way to do that than to come out of the foundation offices and really engage uh, the community and engage the community on their terms, uh, engage the community in their backyard and ask just a very few simple questions of how we can be, again, a more valuable and impactful partner. To ask them to think about what they love about their community. What do you love about Simsbury? What are your uh, hopes and aspirations? What are the, some of the things you're concerned about or frustrated about uh, in Simsbury and, and also in the region, as Simsbury is a very important community uh, in the region. So uh, that was the gist of that. And we'll get into this uh, in just a minute. But before we get started, uh, there is a short video uh, we uh, want to share with you just to, again, provide some additional context, uh, and then we'll get into the meat of the program. So, you want to leave a legacy? Why not send me to college? Help me be a better provider. Or help support local programs. At the Hartford Foundation for Public Giving, through your generosity, we make both big and small dreams come true. This isn't just a donation, this is an investment. Through our careful financial stewardship, your money will last forever, helping numerous nonprofit organizations in the 29-town greater Hartford area, changing countless lives along the way. It's a tradition that goes back to 1925. The Hartford Foundation for Public Giving is one of the oldest and largest community foundations in the country. We help donors impact the issues they care about, such as education, health, the arts, economic and community development, early childhood, and more. This is your community, and it's our community too. More than 90 years of experience means we understand the big picture, how different issues connect, and what will be needed in the future. The Hartford Foundation is invested in the vibrancy of every town in Greater Hartford. We award grants, share knowledge and data, influence public policy, host events, and build partnerships. But most importantly, we help people like you make a difference. Whether you want to establish a scholarship, join a giving circle, or start your own donor-advised fund, we are here to help. We'll make sure you reach your philanthropic goals, whatever they may be. The gift you give today will make an impact now and for years to come. 
It's about making Greater Hartford a better place. And you can make a difference. We promise. So, what will your legacy be? The Hartford Foundation for Public Giving. Together for good. <laughs> and it was really just a video that set context. It gave you uh, a little bit of background of uh, who we are, the work that we are doing in this community, the fact that it is really about engaging uh, with our stakeholders. And uh, a couple of the things that the video points out is the fact that we are a community foundation for 29 communities in the greater Hartford region. Uh, we have been around for now 94 years. We are the largest community foundation uh, in the state of Connecticut, uh, one of the oldest and largest community foundations in the entire country, uh, but we are also your community foundation. As much as we are a regional entity, uh, we are the community foundation for the town of Simsbury. Uh, and in that regard, that's why we thought it was important to ensure that we were having conversations and hearing directly from uh, the residents, the stakeholders, the business owners, the people who live, work, play, who love uh, the town of Simsbury, uh, in order to help us inform and shape the work uh, that we're going to do over the next several years. So in order to do that, we decided to have these listening sessions. And that's important because it is a listening session. That means that, uh, you know, this is uh, us doing less talking and more listening. So to that end, uh, these are designed to be engaging. Uh, we have a microphone that will go around as you uh, offer your comments or questions or observations, not because we don't think you can project, but because we're capturing this uh, on audio video, we would ask that you would uh, wait for the microphone so we can make sure we capture this and, and are able to record it. Uh, if you would just uh, introduce yourself and, and tell us uh, your uh, connection, whether you're a resident here or you live here or you work here or you just have some other connection to Simsbury, and really uh, just think about uh, a few questions. You know, what do you love about the town? What makes it special? What is the quality of life that attracts you here, keeps you here? Uh, what are the things that, again, that concern or frustrate you about the town or the region? Uh, and how can we, as your community foundation, uh, be a more impactful partner? So uh, I'm going to help facilitate the conversation. There are a number of my colleagues here from the Hartford Foundation. If uh, the Hartford Foundation staff, if you would just sort of wave your hand and, and I'll uh, you know, make sure that you're all, oh, wow, a lot, lots of them. They, thank you all. This is wonderful. Uh, so uh, the varying expertise and perspectives, uh, I uh, try to take the easy questions and then uh, field the hard questions and disperse them to the staff who is much brighter and more talented than I am. So I will start and I will say this for at least the last time in this session. There is an easy way to do this and a hard, awkward, not hard, but an awkward way, awkward for you all to do this. So the easy way is just, you know, jump right in, uh, think about those questions, offer your observations, your questions, uh, your comments, and, and we can get it rolling. Uh, the more awkward way is if this is a slow start, uh, I will take eye contact as a sign that you have something to say. <laughs> so you're either going to have to strain to look away from me and sort of make sure I'm not looking at you, uh, because if so, I'm just going to start pointing out people and, 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 and we can do it that way. So. Uh, we have had a 100% success rate up to this point of people choosing not to follow the awkward path and, and, and not try to make eye contact, but really it is about hearing from you. So uh, let's open up the floor and, and really just, just simple uh, questions that we wanted to, to offer of, of, of this town, this community, uh, you know, what makes it special, what are things we can do. There are organizations here that we have funded as I looked across the list. Um, we are uh, in the uh, beginning stages of uh, rolling out our new strategic plan, and we'll talk about that uh, in a little bit and how that relates to uh, our, our, our efforts in the community. So really just want to open the floor up. Uh, I'm going to go get, get, grab a sip of water. That'll give you like three seconds uh, to start thinking questions, comments, and, and just really it's time to share uh, with us so we can take this, take this back. So please, questions, thoughts, observations. Uh, what makes the community special? What, what do you like? What are you concerned about? Future, past, uh, current activities, anything of that nature. Thank you. Hi, I'm Barbara Wolf. I've lived here for, I don't know, 35 years, actually. Um, and there's so much I love about this town that I just want to share some of that. Um, Thank you. And a lot of it is um, the spirit of the people here to volunteer. Um, we have the Simsbury ABC House, which I think um, the young men who uh, live there have contributed more than we've given to them. And I love the way that the town um, comes together to support that. 
And um, we've got the Hartford Symphony coming to the Simsbury Meadows. I'd love to see more programming there. Um, I don't want the symphony to ever go because it's just such a great event in town. And, um, you know, everyone knows our recreation system and our schools are beyond fabulous. Um, the land trust that has Simsbury Land Trust, again, all the people who have come together to contribute money to keep our, some, you know, our little bit of rural nature left in this town. Um, we could use some more economic development. Okay. And I think everyone knows that we lost the Hartford and Eversource and you know some big names. So, uh, and I'm not sure how that happens. Okay. I, I mean, I don't know. And I guess I could go on and on, but I'll give someone else a chance. Well, a, a couple of questions. You said the Simsbury a ABC House. Well, yeah. tell me a little bit about that. Um, a better chance is a national organization. Oh, okay. Right. And. Um, in Simsbury, we have a home that can have up to nine young men who okay. come from uh, inner city areas, usually New York, mm -hmm. New Jersey, Pennsylvania, okay. outside of this area. Right. And then the townspeople support that, and uh, the kids go to um, Simsbury High School. Mm -hmm. And um, I can't remember exactly the number, but it's maybe 93% go on to college. and. Wow. Thank you. <laughs> it's been a long time since I was on that board, but um, it's just the beauty of the number of people in this town who step forward. I sort books, used books for the big library sale, and what do, what do we earn? $40,000? Who's from the library? Yeah, wow. something like that. Okay. Just with our efforts um, to help the library out, that the, the okay. Simsbury Friends of the Library. So. Um, again, it's just the spirit in this town of the people. Well, thank you for sharing. And that's exactly, these are exactly the types of things. So let me quickly respond that virtually everything you named are, are areas that uh, we find important, that we are desirous of uh, engaging in a conversation of how to support the community. You talked about the symphony, so the arts and culture, uh, how that improves the quality of life. Uh, the ABC House, that uh, is consistent with what we're um, looking to do within our strategic plan are how can we be more inclusive? How can we assist individuals within our community uh, who have been excluded and have not had some of the same opportunities that we have had to have those opportunities, uh, educational opportunities? Uh, you touched on economic development. Uh, I'm excited that that is one of the areas that we're focusing on in our new strategic plan, community and economic development. So we would welcome a conversation with uh, stakeholders of the town as how uh, we can bring some of our investments. We have our traditional grant tools, uh, investments, but we also formed a new subsidiary about six months ago, HFPG Impact, uh, specifically around the notion of doing inclusive economic development. So that's exactly why we're here, is to really help facilitate and engage in these types of conversations, knowing that we don't have time to do them all here, uh, but that's why the staff is here, so we can really have follow-up about uh, what we might bring to, to, to those areas. So thank you for sharing. Hi, it's great that you're here. Thank um, you. My name is Wendy Helmkamp, and I'm a Simsbury resident for about 20 years, and I am also happen to be on the board of the A Better Chance program. Um, I, when I moved here, I moved here from Evanston, Illinois, and one of the things... <laughs> <laughs> well, well, one of, the, one of the reasons that our family moved here is one, because we, we did want to um, get out of the city and we wanted, um, you know, our family is very outdoor oriented and we wanted to live in a place where we had great access to hiking and biking and all that. And, um, and the thing, though, that we lost, we felt we lost when we moved here was the um, diversity that Evanston had and also... Um, and this is just more of a minor thing, but just having to drive everywhere here was um, something that we missed, being able to walk um, to get what we need to in Evanston. Um, and so the point about diversity, though, is what, what I would really love to see is um, this town is, is, yes, very supportive of the A Better Chance program. And we also have the first church that is, you know, really oriented towards um, social justice, racial justice. We are, you know, pride ourselves on um, the fact that Martin Luther King spent summers here and it was influential for him. And, and then we have economic development. And I would really love to see those various dots be connected and make this town a place that 
is more diverse, is more inclusive. Um, we have a lot of um, uh, apartments going up. I don't know, you know, I, I have no idea what, um, who they're oriented to, like what's possible. Um, and the other thing that I'm reminded of is after Charlottesville, um, the incident at Charlottesville, the, the whole um, a white supremacist incident, we had a bunch of people from the town who showed up at a vigil for that. And the, um, I, I, one of the, um, uh, I don't remember who it was, but one of the messages that was, was given to us and like it was celebrated that, yeah, that we were all there. We're a very caring community. And at the same time, it's like, when do you go over the mountain? How do you engage with other towns? And so I would some way or shape or form love to see all of those connections be made. So, um, so, so we can just, you know, in addition to our, you know, donations and all that, sure. that we're actually interacting with people. Um, and that would, you know, I think benefit, benefit me, benefit everyone. <laughs> so Thank you. that's where I'm coming from. What, what you're saying is music to our ears. You have, uh, in effect, really uh, described the essence of where we are going with our new strategic plan. And, and, and I can't tell you how exciting it is uh, to hear uh, you share some of those aspirations and to be in here in Simsbury and, and to know that this is a community uh, that uh, is, is embracing that. Because as we've talked about our work and looked back over uh, the body of work that we've had, and it's been, you know, the, the, the foundation in 94 years has engaged and has built a body of work and has grown uh, as a direct result of the philanthropy and the generosity of thousands of people across the region. We also recognize that the landscape is changing, and we recognize uh, that if we're going to fulfill our mission, and our mission is about putting philanthropy into action uh, to create lasting results, you know, so we have vibrant communities across the region, that we have to be willing to look at the region and, and understand that there are, uh, the data that we have shows that there are growing disparities, that there are segments of our community that aren't benefiting uh, from a growing economy rising wages, uh, that do not have access as entrepreneurs to, to capital and opportunities, uh, that do not have uh, educational opportunities, as has been described, that don't have uh, necessarily access to, to housing, whether it's uh, housing because they want to live uh, in the city of Hartford in, in a quality affordable housing, or housing because they perhaps, like your family, uh, love the city, but also want to have access to the beautiful recreational and, and, and environmental amenities. So as we looked at that data, uh, it, it really became clear to us that as a community foundation with the mission, uh, that we could not fulfill that mission if we continued or if we chose to ignore some of those disparities and some of those inequities. And the data also revealed to us that those disparities are often driven by race and ethnicity, by place, zip code, or by the income level. The fact that someone's trajectory and the quality of life could be adversely impacted by their zip code, that's just, just, just isn't, isn't something that we should accept. That you happen to live in a zip code, so your propensity of uh, a, a lesser level of education, uh, a lesser quality of life, or your propensity uh, to be incarcerated is higher because of the, before you've done anything that would have you engage with the justice system, just the notion of where you live the propensity is higher. And, and we find that that is wholly unacceptable. And it didn't happen overnight, and we're not gonna fix it overnight. But what we're saying is that we believe that there is an opportunity for us to utilize our resources, the financial resources, the research and evaluation, the public, all the tools that we have, working in concert with our communities, our stakeholders, our nonprofit partners, and our donors, to really start focusing on some outcomes that would ultimately allow us to say, you know what? we can move the needle and start addressing some of those things. So to hear you say that uh, as we wrestled with this and as we recognize that there might be some who say, well, as a matter of fact, some, some have said, well, you know, you know, the Hartford Foundation isn't a social service agency. I, I get that. And the Hartford Foundation isn't explicitly a social justice organization. We get that. But when we look at our mission and when we look at our values that say income driven, outcome focused, in, you know, informed by the data and focusing on those outcomes that we think that that very much validates that approach. So to hear you say that, uh, I, I, I can't thank you enough. And I hope that that will result in follow up conversations. That's why we're here 
is to have the conversation here, but then really have follow-up conversations about what specifically you know, we can do in concert with our communities to achieve some of those aspirations. So thank you very much. Yes, ma'am. Hi, my name is Roseanne Druckmann, and I've lived in Simsbury for uh, 35 years. And we were also attracted to the town because we thought it was um, beautiful. That was the first thing. It had good schools. Uh, but we found it was a very vibrant town, and I agree with everything that was said about the beauty and the, the strengths of Simsbury. But you have touched on something else that I am concerned about, and that is there is polarization. Uh, we are all in our bubbles, you know, and we're at looking at our screens and so forth. Uh, so we do need a lot more bridges. And I have been working with a new group in um, the Farmington Valley called the Farmington Valley League of Light. And we have come together as um, people who have a spiritual sense, but welcome anybody to our efforts. And um, we are deeply concerned about this polarization and what it means. You know, we had an incident in the Simsbury uh, Public Schools. And some of it really is um, that we're not, we're learning how to talk to each other. And so there's issues of civility and there's issues of techniques that we have to regain in this uh, technological age. And we are having a um, workshop in April uh, to talk about some new techniques of dialogue because that is the piece in terms of bridges. And uh, we are grounded in our spiritual heritage, but um, we think there's a lot of building community that we need to still do in Simsbury, even though we have these wonderful civic organizations, the library, I love this place. But uh, we have an opportunity, I think, to be a leader on some of these issues that relate to what you said, right. building bridges. Right. And, and I don't want to be presumptuous and like invite ourselves to that, but if it's, if it's open, <laughs> then we, we would love to... Because, you know, the notion of building those bridges, it, it absolutely takes a community. You know, an organizational can't, by itself can't do it. Individuals singularly can't do it. Now, they're all important, but it takes that dialogue. And it's not always comfortable. Uh, it isn't always, it, it, it's very rarely easy, but it is necessary. Because the more we understand how inclusion uh, adds value, uh, adds wealth of experience, uh, you know, it, it only bodes well for us in our individual towns, but us as a region, because we truly exist as a region. When you talk about you know, economic development, uh, it isn't confined to the political subdivisions uh, that we often define ourselves by. Uh, those are lines on a map and they, and they serve a purpose, but when we talk about enriching a community, whether it's through the arts and culture or through the dialogue of building those bridges, uh, the individual town benefit, we benefit as resident, residents, but the region benefits. So uh, again, thank you for sharing that and, and we would love uh, to bring whatever appropriate tools or resources we can. We're not there to drive the conversation. We're there uh, as an asset, uh, as a tool that if there's something that we can do to help advance that notion of building those bridges, uh, you know, we are eager to do so. And it is absolutely consistent uh, with, uh, with why we uh, use the data and with the support of the board and our donors are embarking upon this plan about really being more inclusive and addressing those disparities uh, and, and acknowledging that, it, again, the, the conversations aren't always comfortable, they aren't always easy, but they're necessary, and at the end of the day, we're better off for it. So thank you. Oh, we got some momentum going now. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Hi, my name's Lauren Miller. I've lived in town here. Oh, 32 years ago, married my husband and moved here. He grew up here in town. So we have deep roots, and we do love it here. Um, I hate the thought of leaving it someday. So um, we're in it for life, I think. And uh, it's because we do love the community. I have been part of many organizations throughout the years. And I just want to say that it is my great privilege right now to serve as a trustee of this library on its board. And I see some of my colleagues and former colleagues in the room. And I just want to say what a great experience it is to work with a group of people who are not just civically minded, but civil. They really do the work that government should be doing at all levels. So I think they're wonderful. Thank you all for being great. Um, one thing I just want to touch a little bit on the idea of, perhaps we can call it isolation. Mm -hmm. We don't have great transportation venues back and forth through this little valley of ours over that little hill. 
it's such a huge barrier. I don't know if there's anything that the foundation can do, but systemically, I think if we can effectively share our resources, it will have to be done in a, a huge way. It can't right. just be funding individual little events and so forth, or, or maybe hiring a bus once in a while to bring people back and forth to right. Hartford and, and Simsbury. We, I hope that the foundation is gonna look at this very big picture issue of physical isolation. Absolutely, and I, this is something that we have heard uh, on a very frequent basis as we've had these discussions, that the notion of uh, enjoying the beauty within the communities that, that, that we serve, but that disconnect, the physical disconnect, the challenges, as, even as you talked about uh, you know, your experiences in, in Evanston, Illinois, being able to easily get uh, about and throughout the community. Uh, I can tell you I'm from Youngstown, Ohio, which is very similar to, to Hartford, but I spent my family out of the last six years in Washington, D.C., where you know, I sold my car because the ease of getting around uh, the area through public transportation and walking and things like that. And we recognize, we're pragmatic, that we're not going to have a, uh, a New York or Washington or Chicago metro system. Uh, but it is a challenge, as you talked about. And while we've seen some improvement, the CT fast track and things like that, that still doesn't n provide the type of access uh, that is warranted here. Uh, in Simsbury and so many of the other places. So uh, issues like that aren't going to be singularly solved, both from because of the public policy notion, the, the actual uh, the, the fiscal uh, investments that are necessary. But we do think it's important to raise our voice. And to that end, we have uh, collaborated with other community foundations uh, across the state to really provide some thought leadership and to provide some convening and discussion around that. So I don't have an easy answer, but I can tell you very affirmatively uh, that we think that there is a role that we have in helping to facilitate that conversation. We think that there's a role, there's a role that we have if it means bringing uh, innovative thought leaders from other parts of the country, communities that are similarly situated to see how they've addressed that. We'd be happy to facilitate and host that. Uh, if it means uh, engaging in advocacy and public policy uh, at the state capitol or, or at the federal level, we think that that is something that we certainly uh, would have a role in doing or bringing whatever appropriate resources. So, uh, you know, it, it, we've heard it. It isn't easily addressed. But the fact that we've heard it time and time again, a desire to be more uh, c connected in a way that allows for, uh, like you talked about, beyond the, the, uh, uh, the occasional bus that comes in. And that's, that's important. I'm not, I'm not negating that or, or diminishing that. But how can we, from a pragmatic standpoint, figure out ways to be better connected so uh, you know, the beauty and the amenities and the quality of life in Simsbury that you all enjoy. We heard the same thing, uh, you know, from the stakeholders out in Bloomfield who are proud uh, of, of their community and all that it offers uh, and, and so many other communities. So that's where, uh, you know, we want to see ourselves as a resource and challenge us. That's the other thing. We welcome the challenge of uh, these issues and figuring out if we don't have a role, how we might uh, either directly or indirectly play. So thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, Joe Buda, I've uh, been here about 26 plus years. And one of the questions I have was, I mean, th we are the last stop sort of on the, the tour. Uh, what are some of the major themes that you, you've heard that seem to be consistently coming up between the towns right. that are there? Sure. So uh, one of the major themes, and we already heard it here, is the, the, the need for volunteerism. The fact that there are uh, a dearth of, of, of there's a, always a small core group of faithful individuals who are just giving their time and their effort and the energy, uh, but it's still not enough. And, and how do we not wear out that small core group of volunteers and we inspire and connect more volunteers? And we've heard that so frequently, in fact, at every one of the sessions that we committed to facilitating, uh, you know, some sort of symposium or, or, or bringing together, convening around that. Uh, and, and you'll hear more about that later on this year. So that's a common theme we've heard. Uh, we've heard this notion uh, around housing, uh, that there are uh, communities that are wrestling with uh, how to have housing that increases the diversity of the community. Uh, but very honestly, there are also some that have the NIMBY, uh, that's great, but just not here. Or what does that mean when we talk about increasing housing opportunities? You know, are, are people going to come that maybe have a different value system or look different or have a different? So we've heard communities wrestling with that. Transportation, as I talked about. Uh, part of what we've heard is um, a desire to have a, a visioning uh, session for the communities. Communities have evolved and changed. 
but we've heard a number of communities talk about that there isn't a central vision that really uh, gives the community a collective aspiration to where we want to go or what is it that we want to look like. Is our commercial center still going to be the hub of activity and retail and things like that? Or how do we uh, make better use of some of the facilities for purposes of convening and gathering? So those are some of the common things we've heard. Uh, and I think the, the one thing in terms of generational, so uh, making sure that there is a place for uh, you know, the seniors of the community to, to gather and engage. Well, at the same time, we've heard that from some of uh, the younger people in the community and some communities have said, well, you know, that can be sometimes the same place, that intergenerational uh, convening. So those are some common themes uh, that we've heard and we've invited those communities to have ongoing conversations. Uh, in some instances, we've, saw, we've already heard some specific approaches they would like to take. In other instances, they have asked us to continue to convene and facilitate a discussion around those things. Sure. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Well, my name is Elisa Phillips Griggs, and I work here in Simsbury. And I live in Canton that once historically was part of Simsbury, so maybe that counts too. <laughs> <laughs> And one of the things that really um, draws me to this area is our opportunities to get out and about. Um, we have a lot of hiking access, we have the rail trail, and most importantly, we have the river. Full disclosure, I work for the Farmington River Watershed Association, <laughs> but we're really excited that our river just this week got designated this section of the river right through our town here as wild and scenic. And this is a really, really <laughs> cool thing. We're all excited about that. <laughs> so these are resources, all of these things, that I think most everyone here engages in some sort of recreation or enjoyment of looking at the river. I saw your slideshow started right out with a picture of the flower bridge. I call that my office, if anybody ever wants to meet with me. Um, and so it's really important to us to protect these things for us, but also these are draws for people coming from other places like Hartford to recreate, and we need to be very careful that we encourage the right kinds of development in the right places while we protect the integrity of the town, the integrity of the river, the ledges, um, the rail trail, all of these things we cherish. And so we need to always have that in context. So perhaps there are ways to bring more people out, perhaps there are ways to develop more ways for people to engage and get out on the river, but we need to do it very intelligently. And we have a lot of volunteers, but if anybody wants to volunteer, we're always looking for more volunteer opportunities. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Hi, I'm Dagny Griswold. I've lived in town for 37 plus years. Raised our. Well, oh, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> I'm not used to mics. <laughs> Uh, I've lived here 37 years, raised our children in the school systems, and I have many things I could say, but to segue off the river, I, the town is now going to create a park right near the Flower Bridge. I would love to see kayak canoe rental uh, facility be a part of that. And many years ago, I lived closer to the other bridge in town and watched the 1800 vintage bridge be torn down. It was a one lane bridge replaced by a much bigger. But kids from Hartford used to come and play in the park and swim in the river and jump off the old bridge. But they haven't done that <laughs> since the new bridge was built. Uh, but if we, and I know that we have summer camps in like the state park where there are ponds that bring kids out from the cities. But perhaps we could do something with the Flower Bridge area and make that a part of a tourism attraction as well. So I don't know if the foundation gives grants for that sort of thing. But the foundation has been helpful in giving grants to other things in our community. I sing with the Farmington Valley Chorale. I used to be uh, sing and dance and do, the do costumes and scenery for the Simsbury Theater Guild years ago, and I know that groups like that have asked for some funds, and I think they've probably gotten some from mm -hmm. the foundation, as the land trust that I've been involved with has funds managed by you uh, for some ongoing uh, help, 
And on the theme of affordable housing, I was on the Affordable Housing Partnership Committee in this town many years ago because I had gone to grad school in urban planning and worked in that field in uh, community development. And so we did build a um, complex in the north end of town called Eno Farms. Uh, but I haven't heard much about affordable housing in 20 years or so. At that point in time, there was a focus from the Capital Region Council of Governments to engage the suburban towns to do their fair share. I don't know what's happening with that anymore, but right now, after the uh, financial crash of 2008, we haven't seen too many McMansions being built here, but we've seen a huge uh, influx of apartment mm -hmm. buildings, partly because we rezoned industrial areas to allow mixed use. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of things happening, but I'm, it's a vibrant community, and I really love all the cultural and arts uh, programs that are here, and I think we could do more to bring people down to the river. Mm -hmm. We gave our kayaks away to our grandchildren. <laughs> Matt, I'd love to be able to just rent some and make it easier instead of lugging them on the top of my car. <laughs> so that's that. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Hi. Hi. Uh, my name is Patty Gonzalez, and um, I used to live here about two, deca two decades ago. I'm originally from Long Island, New York, but because I do love Simsbury so much, or did at the time, we, I moved my family back here. And um, I, I was a state employee, and after I you know, ended that, I became a civil rights activist. So just recently, I met with the House Speaker, Joe, Joe Arizimowitz, about um, you know, non-disclosure agreements and um, employment contracts for women's rights to take that out of all contracts, because it doesn't belong there, and we quoted a lot of things. But, um, you know, coming back full circle in this town since we moved back, you know, our thing is, you know, education for children. And, you know, I, I spent a lot of time at the legislative office building for family court reform, women's rights and all that, all kinds of things. Um, in the school system here, it's great. We love it. But one of the things that we've noticed is that they don't have a lot of academic or um, like spelling bees or educational things. I go to the Board of Education meetings, I've suggested it. Children should have, um, you know, sports are great, but what about having academic, like my son loves math, science, and astronomy. I joined the uh, Greater Hartford Astrological Society. We go to CCSU, Wesleyan University, uh -huh. Yale University. He's 12 years old. Right. He's got a high, high IQ, but he's in fifth grade at Central School here, and there's nothing for him. He doesn't relate to the kids because he's half of them are like this high and he's like this high but he's such a like a nice nice kid um he doesn't mind it but intellectually he's not thriving because he feels like he needs more mm -hmm. education so that's one of the things that i want to focus on another thing in this town since i moved back the gas station there's a gas station here um abandoned okay. the town has not done anything with it there's also andy's um it used to be a supermarket that plaza there that's empty there's nothing there the third thing is the dog park. And I know this may not mean a lot to a lot of people, but it needs to be redesigned. We need more benches. There's young families who go there. I go there with my, my kids and my dogs. Um, we need more benches. We need more concrete areas. It needs to be beautified. I mean, I have a design in my head, but I'm not going to share that. Um, but intellectually, I mean, the school system here is amazing. You know, and I work for the NAACP also. Um, and, you know, I, we disagree, agree to disagree on a lot, because I don't agree with a lot, even though I work on their legal redress committee. But I'm all over the place with a lot of civil rights stuff. But as far as my community goes, I, I wish it was more diverse. But, um, you know, it's something that, it, it takes time. You know what I mean? It takes time. And we need to um, remember that, um, you know, it, it's, it's not going to happen overnight, but it will happen at right. some point. Well, again, thank you for the work that you uh, yeah. continue to do. Yeah. And in terms of how that relates to this community, we, we welcome those conversations. You know, what would be the appropriate role that we can play to help convene and help facilitate those conversations? And you mentioned a, a couple of specific projects, as did you. And, and let me uh, tell you something that we were ecstatic to uh, announce back in November is that as we 
had these conversations with our communities. We heard lots of great ideas, uh, some of which uh, we have been participating in, some of which we invited conversations uh, to figure out how we might participate, and some of which ultimately it became, boy, that's a great idea, but you all don't need necessarily to come to us for that. Uh, the notion of having resources situated in the community where the community could make its own decisions about some of those things just began to percolate and we got more and more excited about it the more we talked about it. Uh, and in November, we announced that we established, are establishing a community fund for every one of our 29 communities with an initial investment of $100,000. Uh, 50,000 of which can be used in, in any way, in, in an immediate form, and 50,000 of which will be endowed. But the other exciting part about that was the board was very clear uh, to uh, admonish us to announce or remind the communities that they saw this as just an initial down payment. So it was a $2.9 million investment in, each, in, in totality of the 29 communities. But what was key here is that we are going to be working with the communities to establish uh, what are in effect community advisory boards uh, and not boards made up of, uh, you know, and I was a former elected official, so I told the fellow mayors and select uh, men and women that, you know, don't get overly excited or disappointed. This isn't, you know, for the municipal fund. Uh, this is for the community and the advisory board who will make the decisions on the grants aren't going to have to come to the Hartford Foundation Board of Trustees, aren't going to have to come to, you know, the executive administration of the Hartford Foundation. The decisions on where those grants go will be completely and solely within the hands of the members of the community. And the only caveat, not even a caveat, is that we want the uh, board to reflect the makeup of the community uh, in terms of demographics and age, and we don't want, quote unquote, you know, the usual suspects that sort of seem to be, you know, always uh, the ones that are, are, are making some of the decisions. So we're excited about that because it's putting uh, the philanthropy and the decision making into the hands of the stakeholders. So some communities have already talked about, you know, how to improve. Uh, we heard uh, some of the young people were excited about potentially improving a skate park. Uh, we've heard people talk about using that as, as an opportunity to leverage, um, uh, to create a meeting space, uh, intergenerational meeting space. We have heard communities talk about how to improve uh, signage on their hiking trails, a whole host of things. So uh, we're excited because, uh, and actually we got some, not, that's not why we did it, but there was a, a national article uh, that published uh, a story about the fact of this growing uh, trend of participatory grant making uh, and that we uh, made a significant commitment to that and, and, and are really, really excited about it. So as you talk about some of these things, we're going to be here. For, we've been here for 94 years. We're going to be here for another 94 years and another 94 years after that. And we're going to continue uh, our investment programs. But one of the things that I think as we uh, really think about how to anchor and engage ourselves in the community in a different way, in a humble way, in a way that is more flexible, less rigid, uh, you know, willing to take more informed risk. Uh, a good start of that is saying, you know what, we're going to put the resources directly in the hands of the community members. We're going to help train and build the capacity and then say, you know what, you all know best uh, what is in the best interest of the community. Uh, it also, you know, will show some of the challenge and difficulty because there are always more needs and desires and aspirations uh, than there are resources to go around. So even in, uh, you know, the $38 million of grant funding that we provided last year, uh, you know, there was four, five, six times that in terms of requests. So you can't do everything, but you try to do the things that are most impactful and that you can leverage. So uh, one of the communities already, as we established and made the announcement of a $100,000 uh, grant, uh, there was a, an anonymous donor who not two weeks after uh, said that he or she was going to double that uh, for one of the communities. So one of the communities already has $200,000 at their disposal. So it's, it's an exciting uh, opportunity for you all to think, you know, this is an opportunity for people who uh, love Simsbury, who have done well or who have very uh, generous philanthropic inclinations to uh, contribute to the, the Simsbury Community Fund and, and to really uh, use that as an opportunity to galvanize and inspire philanthropy throughout the community. So more to come on that, uh, but that commitment uh, has been made and we're excited about the ideas uh, that are going to come out of that. So just, just one small example, or, or to us a significant example, uh, of, of how we really want to ensure that we are aligning ourselves with the community in new and different ways. So stay tuned more, but it's going gonna, it's gonna to be an exciting uh, opportunity for you. We're going to tell you more later. Yes. So 
Again, remember I said I'm going to take the easy parts of it and then the staff. So Nancy Ben Ben has more so information. There's, uh, there's a website that you can go to. Uh, we have some cards in the back that give you the address of the website. So if you're interested, um, check out the website, add yourself to the mailing list or the emailing list so that you can stay informed. And Doug Shipman is here, right, Doug? There's Doug. Doug is one of the trio of folks who is working closely in, in getting these out into the community. So more to come. Yes, sir. I'm John Nagy from the Terraville Village Association. Uh, I've lived in town here for uh, 69 years. Moved here in 1949. I'm 105 years old. Just in case you're on. <laughs> so one thing that I, uh, actually I worked in Hartford for 32 years in the Hartford schools. Okay. So I, I have a connection there. Uh, but we are geographically separated by a rather large uh, mountain. Well, some people would call it a hill. Um, but we do have a way to get there besides getting in your car. It would be hard to walk, although um, in the 1800s, people would walk to Hartford uh, to work. Uh, nowadays, if you're not in a car, you're not going to Hartford, unless you're on a bicycle. Uh, people have spoken about our bike paths uh, as uh, a recreational activity, but it's also... Uh, conceivably a way to get to work mm -hmm. and uh, specifically the bike path being built from Bloomfield over to Terraville mm -hmm. and then uh, envisioned from uh, Simsbury over to Terraville as well. Terraville is also geographically disconnected from Simsbury uh, by the river and part of the mountain. So the bicycle path being built over would connect Terraville not only to Simsbury but also to Bloomfield mm -hmm. and on to Hartford. Mm -hmm. So I think the bicycle path uh, is quite a unique uh, uh, possibility. And in fact, Simsbury has it on their plan of development. And um, it would uh, be a wonderful thing to have it happen. The, the pieces are being put together. Right. And uh, throughout the state, the pieces are being put together. So just like to throw that in there. Thank you. And we'd welcome that conversation. Ironically, uh, yesterday or the day before yesterday, I was having a conversation with uh, one of the representatives from, from Riverfront Recapture, uh, and, and I don't have all my geography down, but I, part of what they were doing was uh, doing a, an acquisition piece that would allow uh, a missing connection. I don't remember which of the communities, but obviously uh, you got Hartford, East Hartford, and, and then as you go further out, uh, but they were excited about the prospect of having negotiated with a family that owned a, you know, a large farm, uh, that ultimately the families agreed to sell the farm and, and allow that to be a part of both the, the hiking trails, the bike trails, but just that whole notion of interconnecting ourselves using the natural amenities. So, yeah, thank you for, for, for raising that, and that is something that we have heard in a, a handful of other communities and would welcome an opportunity to figure out how uh, that aspiration for the communities in the region uh, is something that we can be a part of. Thank you. Wherever you see the hands, yeah, you see them before I do. Hello, uh, Rick Brush. Uh, I'm, I'm a resident for 16 and a half years. My wife and I moved here when our son was one, and uh, he's 17, almost 18. Uh, and our daughter was born while we were here, so she's 15. Um, so I'd, I'd echo, you know, ditto on, on this community. It's, uh, it's a wonderful place with a lot of assets. Uh, and I, in particular, love the hiking trails. And, um, but I, so I wanna, I wanna say a couple of things about Simsbury and then about the bigger, sort of greater Hartford sure. opportunity. So I think one of the opportunities for us is like forums like this. I come here and I get a much richer experience of my own community. So I think um, hosting more of these kinds of forums where we actually appreciate, uh, take, take a moment to appreciate what we have. And I love the um, graphic recording of this and I, I can't wait to <laughs> hang it up in my, my room. Um, <laughs> So basically, you've already claimed this for yourself. So. Well, I, Sorry, I mean, that, that's a slick way of doing it. I like that. You call dibs. It's yours. Right. I, we had a little conversation earlier. You know. um, uh, but really, what I, uh, I think there are opportunities as well. And I think one of them is um, more conversations among uh, parents. Uh, that's the role I'm, one of the roles I'm playing right now. Uh, and I want to thank um, Simsbury Social Services for um, hosting, I think it's called Simsbury Community, 
Community for Care, um, which I think is a great way of getting people together to talk about issues that matter to us all. Um, uh, in particular, uh, have attended sessions around um, substance abuse in schools, which I think is something that isn't, doesn't only belong in social services, but is something we could be talking about as parents. Um, so what I was thinking, uh, and thank you, Wendy, for opening up the conversation on sort of the greater opportunity in the region, and it sounds like that's what the foundation is uh, looking at. So I wonder, just from a very specific uh, standpoint, like as convener, what could the Hartford Foundation do in not only going to the 21 towns individually, <laughs> but uh, bringing them together? And are there, you know, we have a lot of assets together. We have a whole lot more assets right. as a region. Um, I think there were some specific ideas about sharing those, you know, through bike paths that connect each other, or maybe transportation that connect, um, housing that might bring people into the community. Um, are there ways that we could advocate for policy, for example, which would create uh, more equity uh, among the 21 ta uh, 29 towns? Uh, Connecticut's a wealthy state. Right. We probably all know this narrative. Then, however, we're also one of the states that have the highest rates of inequities right. uh, within the state. And uh, I work in North End of Hartford, mm -hmm. um, very different place than Simsbury. Right. I love them both. Mm -hmm. uh, they both have assets. Uh, North End of Hartford has Keeney Park, which is a beautiful place. Mm -hmm. I, um, uh, so, but are there ways for us to think um, more broadly than the town, the city that we live in and come together around common issues and advocate for that? And could the Hartford Foundation play a role in that? And last little idea is, as you were talking about this fund, which is great, mm -hmm. um, it sounds like that is also granted individually to those towns. Mm -hmm. Could there be uh, additional opportunities for collaborating across towns and maybe accessing a, a cross-community uh, fund to do things together? I, first of all, I just love the way you think. So um, I'm, I'm going to give her a couple of seconds. I'm going to ask Alyssa Gordon, the Vice President of Research and Evaluation, who has really helped to lead, who's been leading our public policy initiatives and advocacy, specifically uh, as we have rolled out this new strategic plan that is focusing on the inequalities, the inequities, and, 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 and being more inclusive. So to uh, address the funds, we would welcome, as we've granted each of the 29 towns their own fund, uh, it was sort of very much hoped for that there would be thoughts of, hmm, perhaps we could leverage this. And would the Hartford Foundation be open uh, if a couple of towns came together around a, an idea that was broader or more regional in nature? You know, that's, when I say challenges, that's, that, that's the type of ideas we want to hear. Uh, that without even, um, you know, compromising or, or the town having to, perhaps sacrifice some of its own individual aspirations, uh, we would welcome a conversation and encourage a conversation around that thinking of how towns can think broadly from a regionally collaborative way. Uh, I had the opportunity to serve on the governor's policy transition committee, and the committee that I was on uh, was uh, shared services. And it was really, the name didn't necessarily reflect because it was about regional thinking. It was about how can uh, this group, we were trying to uh, put ideas on the table for the new uh, gubernatorial administration to consider uh, to how to encourage and incentivize that. Because early on, one of the things that was drilled into me was that this was a state of 169 towns. Uh, and they said, don't forget that number. That's a very important number. And, you know, that's a, that's a wonderful, uh, you know, notion of having the individuality and having, but the reality is this is a state with three and a half million people. It's a small state. And if we uh, don't, think and act as a region in many instances, we are doing ourselves a disservice and we will not uh, enjoy the types of uh, opportunities that other regions across the country who have recognized the benefit of acting as a region. And it doesn't have to be that you sacrifice the greatness or the beauty or the attributes of Simsbury or you know West Hartford or East. That doesn't have to be, the, it's not an either or proposition. So uh, we would very much welcome uh, those challenges and opportunities about how to leverage those funds that we have or bring new resources, perhaps, uh, from a regional standpoint for communities that are interested in doing that. Alyssa, if you just talk a little bit about um, 
we talk about other things that we can do in terms of convening and some of the work that we've done uh, on the policy and engaging the, 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 the governor and the legislature around these issues of inequity and what we've been doing even with other community foundations across the state. Sure. Hello, everyone. Alyssa Gordon. Um, we have really, we, our board made a decision um, about five years ago um, that they really wanted to look beyond kind of what we could do beyond our traditional grant making and recognizing that so many of the issues that we were dealing with had a systems component and a policy component. And so the board um, passed uh, some policies, internal policies that allowed us to actually register as an organization as a lobbyist, um, which really just means that we are able to use um, uh, the ability to bring the knowledge we have about what we're learning from our nonprofit partners, what we're learning from our residents, what we learn from um, our community stakeholders to our conversations with, with legislators, with executive agency uh, leaders. And so that is how we've, we've engaged in public policy. We really ground it in our work. We're not just out there speaking on issues just because we think something's a good idea or we believe in it. Um, we're really using it uh, to bring our knowledge forward and to advance the work that we're already doing. And so part of uh, our work in, um, in that area has included you know, traditionally providing testimony um, on specific issues to be able to talk about, well, we, we provided uh, a grant here. Here's what we learned in this grant. This is a, a, a model that you might want to consider. Um, and so that's one way. The other way is we've also convened our state delegation um, and, and talk with them about what we're learning from our grantees, the issues that we're seeing, some of the, what happens kind of on the ground, you know, what the policies look like when you're actually on the ground that we're hearing from our nonprofit. Um, in addition, we recognize that um, so many of the issues are not just, as you're talking about here, it's not just local. It's embedded in a regional context, it's embedded in a statewide context, and just like we have many, many towns in a small state, we also have many community foundations in this state, um, more than, than other states um, that tend to have a more of a, community foundations have more of a statewide uh, focus. And so we have really um, very intentionally reached out to our community foundation peers um, in Fairfield, in New Haven, uh, New London, Waterbury, and New Britain. And the CEOs of those foundations really for the first time in the last year have intentionally come together and said, what could be um, kind of a message that we could come together on? Not necessarily an issue area, but a message that we as community foundations can really speak to our uh, policy leaders around. And where we're really landing is the notion of inclusive uh, community and economic uh, development and growth and the conversation about how you really can't have growth without inclusion because you're missing a whole kind of untapped potential um, of, of people and resources. And you really can't have um, uh, inclusion unless you have some strength and, and growth and, and movement toward you know, uh, uh, prosperity. So we've been really talking together with our community foundation peers and uh, we, are, uh, we had a first collaborative effort where we actually sponsored um, a series in the Connecticut Mirror um, around the impact of the budget on nonprofits, and that ran all last year, and we're looking um, at potentially a similar series looking around inclusivity and, and economic growth. So that's just some examples um, of what we've been doing. And that message becomes even the more potent, powerful, and compelling when we have individuals such as have been demonstrated tonight uh, echoing that, validating that, leading that charge. Uh, so you know, to the notion that, that this is something over the past year that we've really um, gotten uh, behind as a group of community foundations, uh, additional thoughts and ideas uh, as, 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 as might be uh, discussed here and following this notion, we would welcome that because, you know, hearing that, and, it, and it's particularly uh, important, uh, you know, to know that that is coming from a community that, that is prosperous, that, that has wealth and amenities. So the attitude isn't like, oh, we got ours and, you know, hey, good luck and, and, and we wish the best for you. It's, you know, we appreciate what we've been blessed with, but we also recognize uh, that that quality, the quality of life uh, and the aspirations of people on the north end of Hartford are, are no different uh, than the aspirations for people in this lovely town of Simsbury. The parents want their children to have a, a, a great opportunity for an education. Uh, the parents themselves, they want their families to be able to access the outdoor, whether it's because they are welcome to, to utilize the trails here in Simsbury or 
Kinney Park or Goodwin Park. So those aspirations are, are similar no matter where you go. The opportunities are where the challenges exist because the opportunity, the talent, you know, that exists on the north end of Hartford is talent that can be matched anywhere else. But the fact that that talent isn't matched with the opportunity too often or not often enough is, is where we find ourselves. So, you know, again, just hearing this, I can't tell you how invigorating it is to hear this, uh, you know, in this discussion and how it very much aligns with, uh, you know, the, the strategic plan that we are pursuing that will only be successful, you know, if we have those connections and validations and participation from, from so many of our stakeholders. Hi, I'm Kate. I'm on the Aging and Disability Commission, and I'm new on the commission, so I'm still learning. But as a segue to that and that, um, we have parents coming to us with kids who are graduating out of high school and their services are ending. And so there's a few people in town trying to um, work with employers and get... Um, employment, but then there's also the transportation issue. So parents are coming to us very frustrated because they're taking time off from their job to take them maybe to West Hartford for a job. So as far as inclusiveness, that's an important part that I think needs to be addressed. We, we, and it all goes into the transportation problem. And beyond education, once the services are cut off, it's left to the parents. And if the parents a lot of times don't take them, then they're stuck at home. I appreciate it. And inclusion means inclusion. I mean, in terms of uh, race, ethnicity, uh, ability, I, I couldn't agree more. And then the other one, which is my new one, is the growing problem with ageism and employment with aging adults. And then one other thing, which is totally separate, is we've lived here about six years from Fairfield County. And we came up here because of the rural landscape. And that is, we have the wonderful river and everything, but this farmland, which is dying, and the, you know, uh, people learning. We have Simsbury Farms, which there are a few education programs, but I think we all that all of us that live in Simsbury need to remember that it's a dying tradition. It's a dying country side. So I think we ought to bring that in with tourism. Thank you. Just a follow up on that. I think really an important, Joe Buda. Yeah. Uh, sorry. Uh, earlier, you know, we talked about aging and, and really what I'll call universal access to buildings uh, from a tourism point of view as well as functionality. And I think that's a key area that really needs to be addressed in a very historic vintage town in many ways, the getting universal access into buildings. If it's historic buildings, or others, that that could be a world-class standard, mm -hmm. let's say in Simsbury, for an example. So right. that's one comment. The second one, I just want to go back to lobbying, which could be a very slippery slope, because how do you, you know, what are you representing? Are you representing the stakeholders that made the contributions, or is it on a topic of social justice? Right. And it could get very complex on what you're influencing and why. So I just want to know how you're going to handle that. You, you sound like a few of our board members. <laughs> so, and, and that's a great question. And this is what we told our board members. Every day when we come in, the mission of the Hartford Foundation is on the wall. Every day when we come in, the values of the Hartford Foundation are on the wall. And they're not just on a wall for the sake of being on a wall for an interior design look, and it, and it looks great. It's there to remind us why we are here, why we do what we do. So when we decide and evaluate and have a conversation around our lobbying and advocacy, it starts with the mission and it starts with the values. And when, if and when the issue at hand intersects with those missions and values, you know, we have a, we have a, a, a rubric that we put it through and then we have, but if it intersects with the mission and the values and we believe it's appropriate for us to lend our voice or to lend our action, then we do that. We do it unapologetically. But you're right, it is a slippery slope. But as long as we, again, keep focused on the mission, focused on the values, uh, and uh, there are going to be, you know, sometimes stakeholders are uncomfortable with that, and we understand that. There are going to be sometimes stakeholders say you didn't go far enough, and we understand that. But always centering on the mission, the values, 
uh, is w what we committed to the board, and the board was comfortable with that. Um, and, and again, it doesn't mean people always agree. It doesn't mean we'll always get it right, but that's how we keep ourselves, you know, hopefully on the right side of, of that very slippery slope. Yes, ma'am. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. She has a mic, and then we'll come back. She had her hand up, too. They gave me one. It's just I'm like, sorry. <laughs> um, I'm Sherry Landerman, and I am with, work with Joe on the Tourism Committee. I'm also part of the Terrafield Village Association, where I live. I've been there four decades. But I was born in the North End of Hartford, went to kindergarten in the North End of Hartford. Then I grew up and graduated from the Bloomfield School System. Back in the 70s, Bloomfield was written up by one of the um, national magazines as um, an all-American city. It still is very diverse, and back then was probably one of the most diverse um, racially, socioeconomically, and it really still is to some degree. Mm -hmm. But I think that one of the issues, if you talk about connectivity and you talk about diversity and um, inclusiveness, a, it's a geographic issue. I've been a realtor for four decades. I want people to come to this town, um, but to, and I work with people from all over the world. They don't come here. I try. I bring them here. I tour them through here. They don't come here because we're still small. We're more rural than where they came from. There isn't a Walmart, which I'm glad about. I mean, a lot of the things that we love about town, if we tried to get everybody in here, we would lose a lot of it. Um, I think it's really maybe taking what our assets are and trying to enhance them. When one of the women spoke about vacant buildings in the center of town, I'm in Terrafil. We have a lot of vacant buildings. We had over 13 distressed, really tiny priced, distressed sale properties. Our property values here, I have clients buying in communities that I don't even think are close to as special as we are. And they're not they're paying more money to live in some of them now. Um, our tax base is high here. Um, that's kept people away. Now we've been kind of flat for the last several years. So that has kind of helped a little bit. Um, we do have, we're part of the East Coast Greenway. We need to connect it. We're not even, Terrafil isn't even connected to Simsbury yet. Um, and then we can connect to Bloomfield, but that would be good for, um, for people commuting. Um, you know, I think the commuting issue is huge for getting people here, um, but I really think we need to take the resources and the things that make our town beautiful, quintessential New England, and we have to work with those. We have to be open and inviting to other people and have activities that bring people here. I don't know how you get them to move here if they have to come, you know, experience us. One of the things I told... Um, tourism at our last meeting was I had bought that book, Connecticut 169 Club. And I've been visiting every single town in Connecticut, all 169. We're one of the few states where you drive over the border to the next town, town's completely different. Different government, different, different housing, different amenities. Um, so I've done 92 of the 169 That was going to be towns. my question. How many are you? 92 yep. of 169. Since okay. the book came out in October, since Christmas, I have done 92 towns. Um, I'm hoping to get another 10 done this week. Ni done 92 week. towns. Lord, right. Yeah, this <laughs> week. I'm take don't tell my clients I'm taking a day off. Um, <laughs> anyway, out of the 92 towns, there was only one community. It was not in Greater Hartford. Only one community that I actually spent about six hours researching property because I thought I could see myself living there. Um, but that 91 didn't even make me think about it. So we really need to, in summary, I think we all these ideas are wonderful. I think we need to look at not only economic development of big businesses, but small businesses. I've had two businesses in town in the past 40 years. Um, we need to get some more connect, we need connectivity, we need to do something with Terrafil um, so that we have better use. The river is such an untapped resource. I mean, Hartford's just learning that it's an untapped <laughs> resource, yeah. but it's Simsbury, you know, I mean, Riverfront Recapture, it's not been around all that long. We need to do it here and have better, respectful, meaningful use and interaction with the river, not only in the center of town, but also in, in Terrafil. So um, that's really all I have to say. Thank you. But um, Thank you. happy to help in any way. And, I and can. economic value, it is, isn't meaning bringing big box, big box stores in and, 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 and changing yeah. the character of who you are. It is about the assets that you have and how do you build those to enhance the quality of life. Amy? Oh. 
Um, my name is Amy Ziner. I'm the executive director of the Simsbury Land Trust, and we've been mentioned by a number of people. So I wanted to just take a minute to thank you and the Hartford Foundation. We've been recipients from for a significant number of grants for some of the farms and the open space for establishing our office for a consultant grant to determine if we could raise money to uh, attending your nonprofit support programs and many of the other things like the, the event tonight. Um, I'm particularly looking forward to the volunteerism uh, program at the end of the year, whatever you have. But I just wanted to take a minute to thank you for coming to Simsbury, for providing these millions of dollars to organizations like ours to do what we do. Uh, and I encourage you to keep doing it. Uh, if you haven't been to any of the nonprofit support programs, they are wonderful. Uh, we also have, as Dagny mentioned, we have an endowment at the Hartford Foundation, which opens the doors to more grant-making opportunities from them by having your endowment there. And then the man money's managed really well with a, with a well-known organization. But I wanted to just thank you for what you've done for us and all the other people on the list. And uh, well, thank, thank, thank you, you very for much. Uh, uh, the work that you all do. Thank you for the commitment to the community. So we have, we have uh, butting up, there's one more hand. I want to make sure I know my staff is giving me the sort of, let's wrap it so up. So this time. is the longest I've ever sat and not said anything. <laughs> uh, if my wife were even in town, she, she would want she would pic like, what's, pictures. Where's my husband? What, what is so, um, done with him? So I apologize. My name is Bob Hensley. Um, I've lived here for 35 years. I was just thinking, uh, 35 years. Uh, we moved here from the Midwest. Um, never left. All of our children graduated from schools here. Um, all are grown. Two of them live here. Two are partners in our firm, which is great. Um, I re I'm here in a way representing the Simsbury Meadows Performing Arts Center, which is a, just a magnificent jewel that happens to be something that Simsbury put together pretty much with private money. Mm -hmm. And um, it sits down here and between three and 10,000 people arrive there during the summer for different events. The Hartford Symphony summers here like the Boston Pops summers in, um, um, help me, in Tanglewood, of right. course. Um, so I get to thinking about us and who's Tanglewood. But um, anyway, so this wonderful gym um, has, and I listened here, and everybody's absolutely right, is exactly how we feel about the community. But we have the opportunity down there to do even more. And it's not just for Simsbury, because when, when you bring three to 10,000 people here to see Willie Nelson or Tedeschi Trucks or the Beach Boys. Those people are coming from Bloomfield and they're coming from Weathersfield and Hartford. And it's just this wonderful, incredibly magnificent jewel that we have that's kind of a magnet. And uh, the Hartford Foundation has been nice to us too, so we appreciate that. But we have some wonderful plans with the town uh, to try to do even more down there so that we can bring, begin to offer a number of programs right. that currently we can't because since it was built in 2005 and six, we really haven't done the, the rest phase two of it, if you will, which will expand and provide even more programs for both the aged and for young people and in the arts. Right. So I just, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that in a meeting like this. And I know many of you have been down there for concerts and other events that we hold. So um, I thank you too for coming. It's great that you're here um, to listen and it's even greater that there's so much input. But um, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Uh, and, and I'll, yes, Jay, sir. 90 seconds. Yes, sir. Well, what, what am I going to say? No, I mean you've invited you've invited us in. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. <laughs> He's from Missouri, and he he doesn't shut up. Uh, Ninety seconds. January. I'm going to take you out of Simsbury. Excuse me. I got here late. I'm going to take you out of Simsbury. For the last ten years, I've produced a TV program called a Philanthropic Planner. One of our bylines is to create meaningful dialogue about philanthropy. There are other parts of this country, excuse me, New England, other parts of this country that will talk openly more about philanthropy. In January, I had the opportunity to fly to Cleveland, invited by the Cleveland Foundation and Huntington Bank. 
we drove from Cleveland down to this gentleman's hometown in Youngstown. In 16 hours, law firm of Harrington, uh, Hoppy and Mitchell, Huntington Bank, and a TV reporter on a TV on Oak Street or Wilson, I forget where she was, standing there and saying something about, I wonder if Jay Williams did this. So my 90 seconds is, we are very, very, very fortunate to have this talented guy and a committed staff that he has. And the thing that impresses me more in a short period of time that I've been here is that their investment in any community of $100,000 is to create and promote meaningful dialogue about the importance of philanthropy to our communities. Thank you. That was more than 90 seconds, wasn't it? I had no idea. <laughs> You're like, oh, yeah, I'm sure you timed it perfectly. Thank you. I, I, I had no idea. Uh, thank you, you know, for, for bringing us uh, to a close uh, with, uh, you know, the remarks and, and, and the uh, sentiments that you shared with us. And, and I can't thank each and every one of you enough. The fact that we've now every one of our 29 communities and every conversation uh, was built on the previous conversation. And, and I say that, you know, the, the, the notion that sometimes you save the best for last, the fact that this happened after we have rolled out and begun to introduce our strategic plan, which you'll hear more and more of, the fact that the conversation here really validated the strategic plan, it helped to allay some of our concerns, it helped to inspire uh, us uh, to, to be bold about what we're doing and that that would be welcome and embrace uh, by folks uh, here in Simsbury is, is more than I can tell you. So thank you for uh, coming out. Thank you for your ongoing commitment. We uh, invite follow-up conversation. This isn't a one-off. This isn't, you know, hey, we've got 29 communities, we're done. This is just really the beginning of this next phase of our relationship with you. And I'll end with this. Uh, this doesn't happen without, uh, as the gentleman shared, a talented, brilliant staff behind me. I'm the one standing up here running my mouth, but uh, this doesn't happen without the staff of the Hartford Foundation. So thank you all to the staff. And a, a special acknowledgement to uh, our Vice President of Marketing Communications, Nancy Ben Ben. She and her team have led this. And Nancy, Nancy has been with the foundation for five plus years, and, and tomorrow will be her last day with us uh, as she moves on to, to other adventures. So, Nancy, I just again, thank you for everything. You and your entire staff, and all the staff. Thank you all. Have a wonderful evening. Funding for Simsbury Community Television is provided in part by contributions from viewers like you. Thank you.